The true growing up comes when you understand that I need to break from the past. I am no longer my past. And in order to reinvent yourself in the present, I need to heal. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. So when uh, Miriam and I were deciding what the topic of my presentation would be, what would be the title, um, I told her, you know, I'm really sick of being introduced as the, the parenting expert because it's not sexy enough. So she's like, okay, then just talk about sex. So I said, I can't talk about sex on Sunday morning. Um, <laughs> But let's pretend we're going to talk about sex so that the people will come, and let's call it conscious intimacy. So see? Do you see how many men are in the room? It worked. So I know you probably think conscious intimacy is about, you know, some sort of uh, tantric breathing or some sacred copulation. But like all good sex, it starts with a lot of foreplay. So we have to go to a place before the bedsheet to talk about conscious intimacy. So just like in parenting, where we've understood now that by age two, the kid is pretty much screwed up, <laughs> so it is with conscious coupling. It all really begins in early childhood. Whether you like it or not, you cannot escape your early fate. But there's beauty there. It's not as abysmal or dire as feeling as if you're caught in the matrix of your early childhood caregiver's unconsciousness. You are, but there is beauty there. Because this is what life is about, to understand what your earliest matrix was, what was the algorithm that made you you, that allowed you to be the child you were and then grow up into the adult you became and are. And to discover that is the journey of your evolution. So then your earliest years becomes the template, the foundation upon which you begin to understand who it is you are. So, just like in parenting, we must go to the beginning. If you want to understand how to be the most consciously intimate being possible. And just like in parenting, we understand that the child, the child has core needs, very simple core needs, but for some reason, they simply don't get met. The needs are simple. You had them, I had them. Just the need to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, to be accepted unconditionally, unequivocally for who it is we were. But why is that so hard? Why weren't we bequeathed this one treasure? To be authentically free. To be authentically our greatest manifestation, our deepest self. Why? Why is this one gift not just given at birth? Why is it that we have to go through Eons, decades of finding, unfolding, striving, coming to Mind Valley events year after year, <laughs> looking for this elusive gift that was our right, but for some reason never given freely. And this is the greatest orgasmic pleasure possible, not found in some Kama Sutra pose 1012 Part A in the Kama Sutra workbook. He's like, how come I don't have the workbook? <laughs> My, mine only goes to position 62. Well, you'll have to come and take one of my courses. So the greatest orgasmic pleasure, the greatest intimate act is not found anywhere but in your finding of your authentic self. So people come to me client after client looking for someone to blame, looking for someone to cast aspersion, responsibility, accountability, my husband, my child, the system, the, the teachers, the past, my parents, looking because they're trying to find meaning in the wrong place. The one thing about couples, and I always say that there is no client more challenging than the couple. 
No client, even the most defensive parent who must be holier than thou, is not as challenging as the parent. Because it is in the coupled relationship, no matter if it's Bob and Don or Bob and Brenda or anyone of any variety or two or three, people who couple together or triad together or more together, this is where the storms of the past play themselves out. This is the tapestry, the movie screen upon which the drama of your childhood fully unfolds in the couple. So the couple, as a client, I tell you, are the most ornery, difficult, resistant unit ever. They come to work things out together, but it's like to get her and to get him. That's what it's about. <laughs> there is no together. So if I so much as so give the other one more attention, like, oh, nice outfit, or, oh, nice button-down shirt, or nice cologne, or them looking at the guy too much, that's it. Right? Then the woman will be like, you know, every time before session, he's like dressing up and, you know, <laughs> wearing the blazer that you liked six weeks ago. <laughs> and what I begin to see is what I see in every client, but more so here, that we are just children masquerading as adults. <laughs> Toddler tantrums abound in the couple. The fighting is only mirrored by two siblings under the age of five. Every couple that thinks it's a couple is really replaying very archaic dynamics from the past. We're fighting to be seen fighting to be heard, fighting to be validated. I mean, that's it. Why do couples fight? They're not fighting to end global warfare or poverty my way or your way. They couldn't give two hoots about that. They're only fighting as a two-year-old wanting to be seen by the other. But the tragedy here is, is that, you see, when we fall in love, we think we're falling in love. The whole idea of falling is your, is your wake-up call. You shouldn't be falling, right? Because if you're falling, you're tripping, and you're falling into something that's lower, an abyss, a trap. So you're falling in love, you think, with this other person. What we don't realize is that this person is a false idea of who you think they are. And why do I know this? Is because we are living as a false idea of who we truly are. Each one of us lives as an image of who we think we are, a belief system of who we think we are, a tradition, a cultural idea, a script handed down from generation to generation. So we believe we know who we are, but we don't. So we're presenting false self to false self and falling in love with each other. And what I call this is the twin beggar syndrome that they both are beggars, really, but just couched in really nice clothes and really fancy makeup because we look so good in those first six months to a year till the paint comes off, till the mask comes off, and then underneath is a ravenous, hungry, outstretched hand saying, give me, give me, give me, fill me, fill my void. And when that cloak comes off, that's when the rubber meets the road. Because you're like, you want me to fill you? Like, no, that was your job, to fill me. And that's it. But it's all in silence, you see? So we pretend it's about the toilet seat up or down, or the amount of times we have sex, or who cooks or who doesn't. We pretend it's about that, but it isn't. It's about filling the inner void by the other and vying for the empty, for, for the empty pie within to be filled with the other's pieces of their soul. So as long as we don't understand this, couples will still keep coupling and marriages will still keep divorcing because we're looking for love in all the wrong places. To understand what conscious intimacy is, is a whole other ballgame. It has nothing to do with the other. So when couples come to me, they think it's about the other. They think that the other is significant. This is the illusion. We're not in relationship with anyone else, really. Not at, at least not until we wake up. So who are we in relationship with? Pieces of your unresolved, unfulfilled, broken parts of yourself. Seeking for completion. You are seeking for completion in the outside world, but you just don't realize it. So as long as you're seeking completion, yearning to be unified within yourself, integrated as a whole, 
You will keep glomming onto the other as if it's the other, but it is through the expression of that relationship that you are fulfilling wholeness. You are seeking completion within yourself. You just don't realize it. And the illusion of a couple who comes together empty to empty, half to half, or incomplete to incomplete, is that now we use the other or we wait for the other to complete the self and don't do the inner work. So the undeveloped pieces of the self keep staying undeveloped. So when uh, Jessica came to me, a client, so upset with her husband who kept leaving job after job, and she said to me, you know, all I seem to do is uh, to be in crisis mode, to be in recovery mode, as if I'm some, you know, Florence Nightingale to the rescue. I said, what do you do exactly? She said, I spend hours coaching him, holding him while he cries, while he's in despair. So she thinks it's about her partner, Mark. She's convinced if he only got a job, they would be in a better position. It's all about the health insurance and her unsafety in the financial world. It's all about her feeling unsafe that we can't pay the mortgage, we can't pay the bills. So if only he, if only he, if only he. And traditional therapy can go on for years trying to fix the he and the she of our imagination. You see, Mark wouldn't exist if Jessica did not have an emptiness within her. If Jessica did not have an unresolved peace within her, the illusion of Mark would evaporate. There would be another Mark. But the Mark that she sees fits perfectly, couples most beautifully with her empty, broken pieces within herself. Because she grew up, you see, with an alcoholic father, lived her entire life as the oldest sibling of four, completely in crisis recovery mode. She was the Florence Nightingale of her home. So quite naturally, she must recreate this pattern, you see. So the mark who is the mark with her, we don't even know if that's the real mark, but we sure know that she needs mark to be that mark because this is the only role she's played. And so it is with couple after couple. So let's take Hillary. Hillary, who's in a relationship with her narcissistic husband, Steve. Steve is intolerable, he is inhumane, he degrades her, he denigrates her, he puts her down. She is justified to hate him. And she pulls me in, she seduces me, don't you see? And sometimes I forget that it's all an illusion and a mirage. And I go, yes, my goodness, let's get a restraining order. Let's send him to the mental hospital. Because <laughs> Steve the narcissist is, is a force to reckon with. Any the narcissist is a force to reckon with. So, especially this person's partner. So as Hillary would tell me about Steve, the narcissist, I'm getting pulled in. You see, this is what the client does so well. They pull us in to believe the villainous enemies of their life and to take their side and to defend them against this evil other. You see, this is our, our job. It plays out on the micro level. It plays out on the macro level. We're always looking for the evil other because we're seeking redemption, you see? We're always seeking redemption of our soul. We want to be the good guys. We don't want to be vilified. You see, as children, we were always shamed and guilted that we were wrong. We were always hierarchically oppressed, dominated. We're seeking redemption anywhere for fresh air at the cost of our children, at the cost of our partners who we love so much. It's okay. I just want to be redeemed. I want to be seen. Do you see me? Do you see how evil he is and I'm the good one? So we cast these plots, you see? Are we ever casting ourselves as the bad one? Does anyone go into therapy and go very rarely? Does anyone go into therapy saying, you know what? I am a narcissist. You know, I'm abusive. I'm neglectful. I'm a, I'm a sulker. I sulk all the time. You know, I'm like a three-year-old. Have you ever done that? If you did that, you know how much money you would save in therapy? Because this is it. I'm telling you, this is the script every therapist is trying to get you to. I am the problem. So just do that in the first session. I'm the problem. You've saved tens of thousands of dollars. Because you know every therapist is going to get you there. You know we pretend to commiserate and go, hmm, Steve, wow, really? Mark did that, Steve did that. You know, Kathleen did that, she did not. You know that's just the beginning phase of therapy. We're in the honeymoon phase. Because the therapist, like any couple, is believing your false self and going with the story. And you believe the therapist's false self. Oh, she totally is on my side. So we play this game just like every couple. Honeymoon, we trust, we build safety. You can tell me, you can tell me, you can tell me. And then slowly the mask comes off and then the therapist goes, 
you know? I see a pattern here. <laughs> and the pattern seems to always involve one common denominator. You! <laughs> And then, and then the client is like, gosh, Shifali told me, Shifali told me that you would come down to this. This was all a, a trick to get me to pay you for all these sessions. You should have just told me that in the beginning. So I have a t-shirt now, where, which I show clients. It just says, it's all you. <laughs> but still the client doesn't see it, you see, because they're so caught up in their script. They're like, yeah, she, this is for clients before my slot, you know, all the ones who came in the morning who don't have a job. But now, you know, the ones who come in the evening, this isn't, she's not talking about me. I tried, I wore a t-shirt. <laughs> so when Hillary talks about the narcissist and I get pulled in, I forget that this is her childhood drama being played out. And she's casting me as the role, desperate that I am her mother, to see her for who she is. And this is the evil sibling who she's been fighting for chocolates with ever since she was yay high. So Steve is one more narcissist who steals and snatches her chocolate and tears her clothes up and steals her clothes, the sibling that we had or didn't have. And when I tell her that it doesn't matter what Steve does, does it? Because Steve can only be Steve in all his narcissistic glory if you are the pathetic enabler. If you weren't the pathetic enabler, codependent, desiring him to fill you up, desiring to be needed, by anybody. How could Steve be the one who needs if you don't want to be needed? So, so it is that the dance of the couple plays out, all in smoke screens, in mirages, in phantasmic, chimerical mirages. And we think it's the other. This is the greatest delusion. The greatest delusion. But the other shows up in all sorts of ways. The other is the iPad, the other is the alcohol, the other is the pill, the other is the Botox. It doesn't matter what the other is, but it's most deadly in the couple. Because we are real, right? We're the most real. We, we, we know that cigarettes and alcohol are artificial. But a human being is real, so you're really an asshole. <laughs> so it's hard for a couple to take full accountability. So when I tell Hillary, that it's you, it's you, it's you. I don't want to hear about Steve. I don't want to hear about Steve. And she's like, you don't want to hear about Steve today? I'm like, no, I've, I've done hearing about Steve. I want to hear about you. How you say yes when you meant to say no. How you allow when you meant to disavow. How you gave in when you meant to deny. How? How are you being you? That's all I care about. Because you are the one who allows the blossoming of the other. The, the, the seeds of the other can only blossom in your garden because your garden is in your mind. So the other takes fruit, bears fruit, blossoms into the oak tree, large and gargantuan, because your inner terrain is saying, come, invitational, fertile, come, grow your roots in me. But if your soil is not going to allow the tilling of the other's tree, there will be no possibility for the other to grow. So you get to decide what that soil looks like and who that soil invites in. And so it is with Gabby and, and her, her partner, Samantha. So it is in that couple too. Don't think the girls have it easier. They too. So Gabby will complain that Samantha is neglectful, that she's constantly rejecting me. She's angry. And after commiserating with her after a few weeks, then I will tell her, no. You're looking to her as if she's your mother. You're looking to her to fulfill something within you that simply cannot be filled by her because she's empty herself. Do you see how empty she is? So how can we ask the other? The other doesn't have the capacity to do what we're asking. You see, this is the thing with adult couples. We're asking the other to do something that simply cannot be done. The function that we're asking the other to do, to unilaterally, unilaterally unequivocally, unconditionally accept us, the time for that is past. If it did not happen in early childhood, it cannot happen by another ever again. And this is why I do the work I do in parenting, because that window, the window and that function of the parent, the mother, the mother within the father, the mother within the mother, that mothering function is so pivotal, because that mothering function of mirroring to the infant, to the toddler, that I see you, I hear you, I accept you unconditionally, is the most pivotal one because it cements it within the infant, the toddler, the young child, that I am worthy as I am. So if that is not done, I tell Gabby and Samantha, 
The other cannot do it. Now the task for that can only be done by you. The reparenting can only be done by you. The remothering can only be done by you. And how? By you finding who it is you are, who you always were, but it was never given to you. That gift, as I said, was never bequeathed. So now you have to re-gift it to yourself. But looking for it in the other is all a mistake. But it's not our fault, really, you see, because this is the pattern repeated in your home, in my home, in, in my mother's home, in her sister's home. This is the ancestral patterns, because this dimension we live in is predicated on unworthiness. Because otherwise, if it wasn't, if we were all worthy, there would be no capitalism. Capitalism is predicated on our unworthiness. The whole cosmetic industry, the whole technological industry, now artificial intelligence. I mean, don't you think we should be so terrified of something called artificial? We don't even have natural intelligence. <laughs> so, culture, you see, has created a hunger within us. Culture, you see, in the name of tradition, in the name of customs, in the name of institutions, has ingested the parent's mind in lack. So the infant has no hope because within the amniotic fluids here is fear already. So the parent is a pawn, is the greatest pawn to the capitalist system. That's why I work hard to break parents out of their stupor because I go, don't be a pawn. You are, you are completely selling your child out to a system that is only working on your fear. So don't. That's why I want to wake the parent up because I see the collateral damage on the young. So we have no chance, you see, because from birth we are indoctrinated into fear. So as long as that is the predicated foundation of our existence, we will keep seeking the, the salve, the balm, the alcohol to soothe, the injection to ingest, to, to alter reality. Because the reality is too difficult. You see, our inner reality is too difficult, so we're constantly escaping our reality. And today, even more so. You know, we want to hack growth. We want to hack the present moment. We want to live in the future. What are we doing? Unless we understand how culture has lied to us from our birth, and it's not our parents' fault because they were pawns, they were asleep, they were robots, they were reactive. They were dismally unaware. But it is our responsibility to release them and wake up. Otherwise, there will be no conscious intimacy with anybody because we have no intimacy, period, conscious or unconscious. We are not intimate with our own existence. So to become intimate, to become awake, we need to be aware of how culture has lied to us. And culture has lied to us at every level. Everything culture tells us is a lie. It's, but it's so farcical that once you see it in one place, you see it everywhere. And then it becomes a joke. Then you begin to laugh. Then life becomes maya, the true nature of life, which is an illusion. Then you begin to understand, ah, all these systems that culture has set up have just taken me away from who it is I am. And here it is, I'm trying to marry someone who also was abducted from their true self. So what are we doing together? And then raising children together. But this is what we will do, because capitalism thrives on our stupidity, on our ignorance, keeping us in fear, away from who it is we truly are. So as young as, as a day old, we're given a gender. And right there, we are abducted from our true sex, because gender has nothing to do with what biology gave us, what nature gave us. Nature gave us a sex. But culture put on it all sorts of labels and terms. And you know, a girl is this and a boy is that. I don't need to tell you. So right there, there's a split from the truth, from your authentic self. Then you are sent to get miseducated in the educational system. And you go to become schooled in how to be a sheep to the slaughterhouse, where really you should be unschooled. So there we go. And then we're, then we're taught to pray to a God who lives far outside of us and who's white and a man. <laughs> so again, we don't find resonance. And we're like, well, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? But we're told who we are. We're told who we are. We're told who we are, and there is no resonance to our truth. So do you know how disconnected we are by the age of two or three? The disconnection is mired, it's seared, it's imprinted. The scarlet letter is already on our chest. We don't need to commit adultery for it. It's already here. Because the lies that we've been told divorce us from our truth, and we can never find. We're looking, where, where, where do I find me? 
And you're like, it's in that God or in that goddess. And you're like, no, that, that doesn't, that's not me. That's not my authentic expression. And you're told, yes, it is. And your parents, just because they were indoctrinated in the same hierarchy of oppression, they don't know any better. So we cannot blame our parents. This is not about you leaving this room and going, Mom, <laughs> she said that this is what you did to me by the age of two. This is not about them. This is about understanding the ignorance that is ubiquitous. It is a spiritual somnolence. We are asleep in a culture that is thriving on our state of mind, on our state of unawakened un awareness. So the responsibility is in our hands. We cannot wait for culture to say, you know what, don't come to this shitty school system because really it's so crappy you won't even know how to count by the end of 12th grade. <laughs> don't. Culture won't tell you that. Why would culture tell you that? How would it employ people and make money and, and create uh, therapists and educators and coaches and linguists and ADHD medication and a big pharma? How would it do that? There's a whole system that depends on this. And you are part of the system. You are responsible to keep the system going and you feel very obligated. You're like good citizens, marching to the beat of a culture that keeps robbing you of who it is you are. And here it is now. Now we grow up, we've gone, we've been schooled, schooled, schooled away from authenticity, right? And then we're told to go look for love, right? In the other, go find that soulmate. There's one person out there that can fulfill you. So we go looking, really believing in a deluded way that, that well, there's, there's a grown-up out there. <laughs> How old do you think the average age is of this room? See what they're saying about you? It's three, five. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> Because it doesn't matter how you look on the outside and how well you pay your bills on time and how well you keep your, your sparkling jewels in your little case and how, how perfectly lined your lips are. It doesn't matter. And you know that because when the wedding is done and the heels are kicked off and the wig comes off, you're like, who are you? How come I didn't see any of this? Of course you're not going to see any of this because we're all living in false self. The truth is our emotional age. The truth is our spiritual age. The truth is our consciousness. And that has never been developed. It's not our fault. It's never been developed. Who goes to school to learn about emotional health and emotional abundance and how to live in interdependence and oneness? Who? No, none of us. So it's not our fault, but this is the truth. So don't think you are marrying a 29-year-old accountant, you know? <laughs> don't fall for that and look at his bank balance and feel like you're going to be secure because you're not. Because the only security you will ever find first is within yourself, and if you are to find it in the other, it's in the other who has found security within themselves. So seeking refuge in your marriage, right? So culture has told us to marry. Yeah, it's for stability of the society and it's to keep your children sane. How many of you have parents who are still married? Don't raise your hands. The question really is, how sane are you because of it? So culture has told us that you get married, but culture doesn't tell us. Marry your truth. Marry your authentic self. Marry your inner liberation. Become your freedom before you even seek it on the outside. Culture tells us divorce is bad. It's a failure. It's a regression. It's a, it's a dismal um, sliding back in, into a primitive way of being. How could you? It's selfish. This is what culture lies to us. Instead of telling us, celebrate that you have divorced your false self. Celebrate that you have left behind vestiges of your past, you have released the cycle, and you are now entering a new cycle of being. Culture doesn't tell us that, because culture lives bathed in your fear. It is bathed in fear, because out of fear comes consumerism. Only when we're incomplete, we want to eat, we want to buy, we want to fill, fill, fill. So culture thrives on this. So culture keeps lying and we keep falling for the lie. We keep thinking, you know, everyone else's marriage didn't work out, but mine, in my white dress, is going to work out because I'm unique. Yeah, I know I'm wearing a white dress. It's okay. I know I'm just like everyone, all the million girls before me, but I'm really unique. My marriage is going to be different. I know I still want the three-tier wedding cake, and yeah, I want the diamond, of course. It's not because I'm like everyone else. It's I'm unique. Okay. 
So in your unique narcissism, <laughs> you believe that you're going to hack this thing called conscious intimacy. You're going to find it. But really, in truth, it's patterns, repeating patterns, repeating patterns, repeating patterns of a two-year-old looking for love and validation in another two-year-old. This is the marriage. I'm going to attend a marriage today. Really? How old is are the people that are going to get married? Are they two or are they five? This is what you should ask. Because emotionally, that's, what we're, that's the party. The party is celebrating toddlerhood, you know? <laughs> But it's, it's not with balloons. No, we're too sophisticated. We hire the florist and we're getting flowers from Bali. And yeah, we're so sophisticated. See, this is the trick of adulthood. See, children are without guile. Children are without disguise. They're just like who they are, paint, mud, you know, eating their poop. They're just who they are. <laughs> if they want milk, they'll, pull the, they'll have the milk. That's it, they have no guile. But we, we're so sophisticated, you see, and this is the treachery. This is the illusion. The more the masks, the more the foolhardy ignorance. This is why we are all suffering, because adults are the most treacherous. We are simply masquerading as grown-ups. There's nothing grown-up about us. Grow, to be grown-up means to grow yourself up. To grow yourself up in a way that your parents never could grow you up. So in order to do that, you need to leave behind pattern after pattern after pattern, which is karmic in energy. Karmic, well, with, by karmic, I don't mean your destiny necessarily. By karmic, I mean just full of chaos and strive and emptiness and longing and needing. And this is most of us, our daily life. Longing, needing, filling, wanting, looking, searching, out, out, outward. So karmically, we're going to keep redistributing one pattern after another, just, just simply changing one face for the other. Mark for Steve, Steve for Jacob, right? Susan for, uh, you know, Miriam. Another name after another name, it doesn't matter. Because the true growing up comes when you understand that I need to break from the past. I am no longer my past. And in order to reinvent yourself in the present, I need to heal. I need to really do the inner work. I need to go on a sojourn. I need to go on a journey of solitude and contemplation to find who it is I am. There is no hacking this. There is no helmet you can put on and a switch you can click that you will come out enlightened, yes? No pod you can go into to watch your brain waves and then when you walk out of it, you're like, wow, I'm whole. No, the journey cannot be hacked. But the most beautiful thing is that it's unhackable. And today, in this modern era, in this sliver of time, we're looking to bypass the true work. But you are here only to understand that without the true inner work of finding your own intimacy with yourself, there will be no step forward. All this we're doing, this biohacking, infotecking, and uh, artificial this, and simulating that, is all more smokes and mirrors. The Eastern mystics, and perhaps even Jesus and Muhammad, and all the Western mystics understood that you have to walk the path. You have to enter your dharma. Your dharma is your true nature. And you have to walk it. And there is a path. And there are steps on that path. And there is no bypassing that. And the, the most pivotal step is entering into intimacy with yourself. Conscious intimacy, the very best sex you can have. If you've ever had it, you will know this to be true. Can only come when two people meet each other in complete wholeness. And then it doesn't matter if they're just two. I'm just including everyone, yes? <laughs> it could be the whole party. It's about presence. It's about being attuned to the fact that all the roles you thought you played are not you. And when you are aware that all the roles are not you, you can then transcend this thing called I. And then the sexual intimacy that you engage in has nothing to do with you or I. It is to do with something greater. There's something between the you and an I, which is a we. And that we space, to enter that we space, is to enter interdependence, to enter oneness. You cannot enter it if you don't know oneness within your own wisdom. The oneness that comes from entering a solitude of contemplation, a, so a solitary existence of inner awakening, that oneness that you experience, that is the oneness that you take into your relationships where you understand that the other is only a representation of the inner self. So how I see myself is how I see you. So if I don't see myself, I really don't see you. So therefore, I'm lying to you if I tell you I love you because I really don't even know who you are because I think I am someone who I am not. And this is the game we're playing. So no one really loves another. I always say this and I get a lot of pushback. 
Because to truly love another means something very different than what we see. If you really loved another, there would be no marriage contract, there would be no contract at all. If you really loved another, there would be no ownership, there would be no possession, there would be no dependency, there would be no enmeshment, there would be no control. If you truly loved another, you would truly liberate the other. Because when you love another, what you really mean by that in the transcendent sense is that you so honor their being because you so honor your being. You see, once the inner self touches inner liberation, you will never steal it from another being. You know, I, I, when my daughter doesn't want to leave her iPad or her telephone or, you know, the, the 20th cookie, I have such a problem taking it from her because I'm constantly asking, is this an expression of her true self? And I'm always asking, what is the line between her freedom and her sovereignty and my guidance? And it's a blurry one. So if it's blurry between parent and child, it's surely blurry between two adults. Where is the line between offering another complete sovereignty, freedom, acceptance, and being in a relationship? A relationship of true, consciously intimate, transcendent beings looks nothing like a typical marriage. That relationship is the we space. It's the energetic space that lies beyond individual I and you. It is beyond role, it is into soul. It is beyond possession, it is beyond any sort of clinging or craving or any sort of illusion that the other can fill the inner self. It is a complete and pivotal and irrevocable awareness that if I am going to be consciously intimate with another, it can only mean one thing. Freedom, liberation, and unequivocal, unconditional wholeness of the soul. Thank you.